When I first started doing political focus groups back in the 1980s, one of the first things that I asked voters to do was to draft a sort of pen portrait of the generic politician. I asked them to be as full as they could in their descriptions, you know, what would they wear, what kinds of food would they eat, what would they drink, what their interests were, where they would go on holiday. And here's what they wrote. This is in the 1980s. This is in no particular order. They wrote, politicians are upper class, male, wear pinstripe suits, good speakers, drink champagne, drive a Rolls Royce, work in the city, went to Eton, some irony there, uh, holidays in Barbados, snooty, and lives in a mansion. So we've got a charming, arrogant, posh bloke, despite the fact that actually at the time we had a female prime minister. Now, if that generic politician, um, if that was a generic politician, it was also a match for what the Tory politician would be like. However, a Labour politician was different. This is the Labour politician's profile. They were a pipe smoker, cloth cap, takes the bus, holidays in Blackpool, lives in a council house, argues a lot, <laughs> reads the mirror, drinks pale ale, protesting and goes on strike. Or, if that Labour voter happened to live in London, it's a slightly different list. Some of the above applied, not the northern bits, obviously. Um, lives in a squat, <laughs> dirty hippie clothes, smokes pot, militant, lefty, and bonkers. <laughs> or the adjectives that they give. I promise you I'm not making this up. Um, so, 25 years on, in the run-up to the 2010 election, I repeated the exercise. So this is earlier this year. And what's interesting is that some things really haven't changed that much, actually. A politician is still a fairly posh bloke. It is, on the whole, a bloke. Um, although, interestingly, the generic identikit is now an identikit for Labour, as well as the Conservatives. So those two images are sort of merged together. So here are some of the things that they said um, earlier this year. A typical politician lives in a big detached house rather than a mansion, reads the FT, works in finance, articulate, drinks G&T, and smartly dressed. But here are some differences. Now we expect a much more three-dimensional image. Um, it was okay for Mrs. Thatcher to be this sort of rather stern, distant figure. Um, but this guy, and it is a guy again, needs to offer a little bit more Hello Magazine appeal. So. We need to know what kind of wife he has. They need to be loving and loyal. Um, we need to know how many kids, probably a standard 2.4. We even need to know what kind of dog they have, a, a Labrador, since you ask. Um, so the mid-1980s, compared with now, some, another difference is that it starts to look a bit like an age of innocence, because our view nowadays is shot through with a rather kind of sneering cynicism. So here are some other things they said about politicians. A politician drives an environmentally friendly car chosen for its image. A politician does charity work in the constituency and then talks about it a lot. A politician becomes a football supporter in the run-up to the election. And sometimes that hello politics becomes heat magazine politics, so it sort of harshly exposes the bits that you were hoping nobody had noticed. Um, so voters in 2010 also wrote that politicians always look out for number one. They are two-faced, they are shady, they are out of touch, and they're on the make. So how did we get from there in the 80s to here? What I'm trying to do in the book is to tell two parallel stories. And one starts in the mid-1980s, and it tracks the making of New Labour, its ups and its downs, but all seen through the eyes of the voter. But while this shift is going on, a more far-reaching far attitudinal shift is also taking place. So voters and politicians had stopped listening to each other, and voters had, had stopped trusting politicians. And that is the other story. So some commentators talk about anti-politics, but the truth is that voters are not anti-politics. Rather, they are anti-politicians or anti-political parties. 
In fact, actually, they're anti the whole of the Westminster village. So the gulf has never been greater between Westminster villages, by which I mean not just politicians, but policy wonks, commentators, journalists, those people who obsess about policy detail and about the ups and downs of politicians and their advisers, and the voter who has scarcely heard of either. But the two parallel stories have got the same conclusion. Um, politicians and those around them must never, ever sever the connection with voters, because when they lose that connection, they lose. Now, most politicians get this, and they talk quite a lot about how they get it. The coalition government tells us we're all in this together, and how they're going to bring the country with them on cuts. The would-be Labour leaders are all beating their chests about how Labour in 2010 didn't listen enough to the voter. I happen to agree with that. Um, and how they'll be different. But what would being different actually look like? So after 25 years of listening to voters, I think that that connection is essentially about three things. Firstly, it's about being in touch with the electorate and in touch with the national mood. That is really hearing what they say, even when it takes you out of your comfort zone. And if you're a politician, that might happen quite a lot. Secondly, it's about responding in a way that demonstrates what you believe in and how your values translate into policies that really change people's lives. And thirdly, it's about ending what I describe in my book as Peter Pan politics, where the voter never grows up and where politics is at best a spectator sport, something that's done by politicians with, vo with voters looking on rather than a more equal partnership. So just very briefly, I want to take each of those in turn. Firstly, being in touch. It's so easy to say and it's so hard to actually do. The three most important people in the Conservative Party all went to Eton that image of the mid-80s. I mean, right now, people don't even necessarily assume that that might be the case. All five of the Labour leader candidates have moved from Oxbridge to politics with very little real life in between. Now, I'm not saying that representatives have to be carbon copies of the people they represent. In fact, maybe they shouldn't be. But clearly, it's harder to be in touch if your own background is so different from the people that you're purporting to represent. The fewer people in power who have a sense of what normal life is really like, the less likely they are, I think, to be able to meet, read the mood correctly. New Labour's use of focus groups was often criticised, but focus groups provide really valuable diagnostic data that you actually can't get anywhere else. They're not a substitute for politicians being in touch, but they do offer a really unique way for politicians to hear what voters say about them when they're not in the room. Politicians know what voters say when they are in the room, but not when they're not in the room. The successful creation of New Labour was dependent on assiduous voter listening. First, Neil Kinnock's policy review, and then Tony Blair's pledges were great examples of this. Policy making and communications that were rooted in what people cared about. But quite quickly, New Labour got it wrong as well. The dome was a very early signal of that disconnection between voter and the Westminster village. Voters' protests went ignored. It was hard not to agree with the voters' conclusion that politicians were rather more likely to listen to them when they wanted to get elected than when they had been elected. Politicians also struggle to hear what voters say when they're saying things that they would rather not hear. So immigration has now been seized upon by several of the Labour leader candidates. But concern about immigration really isn't anything new. Running focus groups 20 years ago, voter fury about immigration always had the potential to dominate, and frequently it did. It's hard for MPs to understand that voter angst is much less about racism than it is about job insecurity and housing shortages, especially for those all-important squeezed middle swing voters who are too poor, feel themselves to be too poor, to manage without help from the government, but too well off to be eligible for help and deeply resent the unfairness of what they see as a situation where less deserving people get all the priority. Now, my second point is don't just listen, listen and act. And act in a way that says who you are and demonstrates your values and your leadership. In the current Labour leadership debate, there's a lot of talk about values, but really little explanation about how those values are going to actually affect voters' lives. That's where the symbolic policy comes in. What I'm talking about here is a policy that connects with the public and symbolizes your overall approach and values. 
The best example of this, still, is Mrs Thatcher's sale of council houses. It's so good that it needs no explanation whatsoever, and it's so good that it's still quoted by squeeze middle voters now in the run-up to this election doing focus groups, asking what people remembered about the Thatcher era is the first thing they say. Labour's pledge card in 97 was a powerful positive symbol too. It understood that people weren't just voting for better health and education, but they were looking for a different way of doing politics. The pledge card with that really precise menu of very well-tested policies said, we're honest brokers, we only promise what we can deliver. But too often Labour got it wrong. Spin got in the way. Instead of symbolic policies, we had symbolic sound bites. Take the NHS. Initially, the big mistake was to rejoice in headlines about massive injections of cash without actually spending the money. The press may have bought it, but the public didn't once they realized that nothing very much had changed. Correcting this required New Labour to do something very counterintuitive, to put taxes up. But for NHS improvements to have any credibility with the voter, this had to happen. And after careful voter research and consultation, Labour was able to unveil what was to become the most popular tax rise in history, maybe the only popular tax rise in history. The case was made, the money was ring-fenced, it was a symbolic act that spoke to Labour's values and spoke to voters' interests. My last point is what goes wider than party politics. It's about renewing the voter and politician relationship. In the book, I talk about Peter Pan politics, where the voter never grows up and is fed a constant drip of unbelievable promises. This is not all the fault of politicians. Voters should, and do, I think, take some responsibility for the broken relationship. Why the conspiracy of silence about cuts in 2010? Voters didn't want them, but they didn't want the deficit either. And deep down, they knew that they couldn't have their cake and eat it. They knew they couldn't have both. What happens next with cuts is an opportunity for this coalition government to show if their we're all in it together rhetoric really translates into action or not. So far, I have my doubts, but the jury is out. During the 2010 election, I set up a qualitative panel, like a kind of giant focus group of squeezed middle swing voters in Harlow, Britain's fifth most marginal seat at the time. Their observations through the campaign are recorded in the book. After the election, I ran a citizen's jury to discover their remedy for our democracy. They spent several hours considering how politicians can better represent their constituents and how people might be encouraged to take a greater interest in politics. Apart from their excellent suggestion that more good, accessible, engaging literature should be available by Deborah's book, they said, they also came up with a few ideas that provide good food for thought. And here's what they suggested. Remember, as I run through this list, these are their ideas, not mine. This is what the voter has said. They think that we should consider making being an MP a full-time job and that you shouldn't be an MP and a minister, let alone do outside work too. We should have more debates on TV all year round, especially politicians versus the public they think they might win. Better political and economic education, especially information about how policies affect you, should be made available. Monthly results and achievements published by MPs and in local papers. More local politics. MPs to spend less time in London. Investigate electronic voting and video conferencing. Rebrand MPs as local representatives. Formal training for MPs to include apprentice or junior MPs to work in the local area. Job descriptions and annual appraisals for MPs to making, making them accountable and sackable. On politicians' pay, they thought no expenses and pay politicians twice the national average wage. More programmes like Newsround, the kids' programme that presumes no knowledge on the part of the viewer and explains everything from scratch. Tested blind in focus groups, it was the most popular current affairs programme with a large sample of adults because they didn't have to know anything to get into politics and watch it. And most important of all, they said, listen to us and talk about the things we're interested in, not the things you're interested in and give us a chance to get involved. One of the first things I did when I worked for Labour back in the 1980s was a party political broadcast where a succession of voters expressed their heartfelt worries. So a young couple talked about how hard it was to afford to buy a home. An elderly lady was worried about crime. A young mum was unimpressed with the local school on offer. As they spoke, the camera panned back and we saw that they were seated in front of and talking to a brick wall. We've just had a plague on all your houses election. 
that Labour lost, but no one won. Will anything now change? Well, we'll see. Thanks. I have to say, this is an absolutely riveting book. It's also a book to make you sometimes despair and tear your hair out. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a, a terrific up and down story of uh, the relationship between the voters and uh, mm -hmm. the Labour Party and Labour politicians. <clears throat> and sometimes it's wonderful and sometimes it's appalling. But uh, you feel it's a terrific um, bucket of cold water on all sorts of people who might get too many airy fairy political ideas. Now, I think that, as, as uh, Deborah said, as she spent her life doing focus groups, they do tell you an enormous amount. They do tell you truths uh, politicians often don't want to hear. And I like her scenes of politicians being behind um, two-way mirrors watching what's going on where they're not seen but they can see and, and hear what's being said about their world and this enormous and growing disconnect between the language and the world of the Westminster village, which all of us inhabit, and uh, the voters feel increasingly alienated from. But on the other hand, I've always felt that focus groups are also a dangerous temptation, and I think that often Tony Blair was lured by them. I mean, sometimes, as she said, he simply ignored them if they said things he didn't, they didn't, he didn't like. On other occasions, um, it seems to me he looked to them for guidance, which is not the right way either, because what's also clear from reading between the lines of everything that she finds is that people do like leadership, and they admire strong leaders, whether it's uh, Margaret Thatcher or whether it's um, Nelson Mandela or, or, or President Obama. So that <clears throat> you can look at a focus group, if you like, in the rear mirror to see how you're doing or have you done badly, but it doesn't tell you where to go, because people don't know that. They don't know what they want but they'll give you an accurate picture of what they think about what they've got. And I think very often politicians have forgotten that. And they haven't been brave enough to say, well, I'll just give it a go. This is what I passionately believe in. Uh, and I'll try and, and persuade people and see if they'll follow me. Instead of constantly taking their pulse, seeing where they are, in which you get a sort of diminishing returns, a spi downward spiral of more and more depressing politics as politicians follow the people who then rather despise them for doing that. And you don't get new ideas, new thoughts, or a vision, or a sense of direction, or a, a sense of purpose. And I think people spot that very quickly. Um, and more risk-taking, it seems to me, is the answer to focus groups, not more caution. Uh, I, what I love about the book is the description of the voter, which is so brutally honest. Uh, your Peter Pan voter is a wonderful description that we all recognize very well. A voter who wants everything. They want it now. We, they want wonderful public services, and they don't want to pay for it. They want American tax, taxes and Swedish, uh, and Swedish social democratic services available to them. Um, they complain bitterly that politicians are incomprehensible and they refuse to read decent newspapers that might actually tell them anything. Um, <clears throat> they, you know, get a little bit of information off, off uh, television news mostly these days. But, you know, do they watch serious programs? Not very much. They watch, you know, a Channel 4 news or a Newsnight? No, not very much. So when asked what should be done, they say the media should tell us much more about what politicians are doing and what uh, MPs are doing and explain it all much better. Would they read it? Would they help? Um, and I think politicians who were a bit more brutally honest with them would be no bad thing and actually said, look, just get yourself, uh, get yourself a bit better informed. I mean, some of the startling facts in hers was that their utter ignorance of the economy to such a degree that a majority think that interest rates are a form of taxation. I suppose because they hear them being set centrally. And uh, once you have that sort of level of, of ignorance, it becomes very al alarming, might make some people question the universal franchise. Um, but I do think that perhaps politicians should be a bit more pugnacious with people um, if they really are that unwilling to do the basic citizen's uh, duty of informing themselves to some degree, uh, or else you know, not have a view. But anyway, I think that um, what she leaves us with is a vision um, of how much the Labour Party now needs to start all over again. And her going back to the history of the 80s and the 90s 
uh, reminds us that actually Labour's quite far back into that sort of hole it was in then, that it has lost its reputation for economic competence. It took a very long time to gain it uh, during those years and that it has lost its connection with the voters, a sense that they're human beings on our side, people like us, in tune with the national mood, uh, that their values are our values, um, that they're not talking in code, that they talk uh, in, in ways and in visions and in stories that we understand. And I think um, it does make it quite clear that how far Labour has to, to travel to get back to where people are. Um, so it's an absolutely fascinating book and a total delight to read. Tessa, you, you in my experience are the most emotionally literate politician I've ever known. Many is the time we've talked about the problems of emotional literacy and finding better ways of communicating and being in touch. Why was it so hard for Labour to do the simple things that Deborah is describing? Well, I think, that's, I think that's a very tough question. And I'll, uh, I mean, let me just um, try, to, um, let me try to answer it, because I think that um, what we've all got to accept about the process that, and the, you know, the, the, you know, the incredibly rich content that um, Deborah has given us is that there will never, ever be a satisfactory resolution. There will never be a time when politicians are admired by their constituents, are felt to um, understand uh, the people that they represent. It's just not the nature of the relationship, but it can be an awful lot better. And before I actually say anything else, I just want to say thank you to Deborah for, I mean, you know, a quarter of a, 25 years of focus groups, but also um, 25 years of teaching labor uh, how to listen better and how to understand more. And I think that um, it's our weakness that we haven't been better students, but goodness knows what we'd have done without you, Deborah. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. So why, why um, is the kind of empathy and emotional connection with voters so difficult? I think that there are a number of reasons for that. I think that uh, you can only make emotional connection with people if you genuinely don't know the answer and you are genuinely prepared to keep yourself open in that sense of helplessness in not knowing and that you're prepared to take the risks of the people that you're talking to, whether it's in a television interview, in a public meeting, um, in a surgery, uh, knowing that you don't know what the answer is, but they just might help you. And I think that uh, until we can get to that sort of uh, state, it will be very difficult. And there are so many phrases that conceal the lack of engagement, as, um, as Deborah's book so uh, clearly reveals. And we should be suspicious of all of them. And actually, I'm not writing a book about government, but I'm compiling my book of bollocks, which is the kind of phrases that uh, politicians, and very particularly ministers, and I'm sure I often used, um, as a way of not answering the question, not being um, emotionally uh, connected. And I think at the moment, top of my bollocks list is we need a new kind of politics. Beware phrases like that, uh, because they, they count for absolutely nothing. But let me just sort of say quickly, I think the other point about the, the lack of connection is that it does actually take a lot of politicians out of their comfort zone. Um, you know, we come from such vastly wide um, range of backgrounds that it is difficult. And there are undoubtedly uh, colleagues of mine who feel very threatened by that kind of um, in, that kind of introspection, and indeed, once I, when I once suggested it um, in a very benign way to one of my colleagues, he said, "Oh, I'm not getting on the psychiatrist's couch," and that was just simply the um, re, you know demonstrating a, a, an ability to reflect. So I think that is the, the important thing: is it takes people out of their comfort zone. It's loss of control because traditionally, and a willingness to accept the vulnerability of not knowing 
getting all the answers. And, uh, but actually, modern government, which is not emotionally connected, which can't, uh, can't act in an empathic way, uh, can, uh, I don't think can ever succeed. And the result, uh, the result um, we've, we've seen, um, but we, th th I mean, what we got caught into, and actually there's a, quite a bit of it going on now, but it's a more sort of benign period for the coalition government, is, this, is the situation where you have this um, sort of private conversation between Westminster politicians and the media, and it's as if, you know, the, uh, the wider public people are eavesdroppers on this private conversation. They have no, uh, they have no part, um, they have no part to play in it. The other thing I did want to say is that w where I think that the foundation of this, um, of this whole argument is, um, is, is so fragile is that we've never had a proper debate about the public expectation of a modern MP. What is the balance between what many commentators will sneeringly describe as the caseworker, glorified social worker? Well, I'll tell you, every week I stand between uh, somebody having any kind of decent family life, whether it's because of their overcrowding, uh, their threatened deportation, antisocial behaviours, and so do all of my colleagues. Um, and it's, it, it, it is the power of representation. It is not, um, you know, as what is sneeringly described as glorified social work. And anyway, what is wrong with that? Um, glorified or not, social work is an honourable um, activity in our modern Britain. Um, but the second, um, so, so um, you know, first of all, I think, um, you know, what is the balance between constituency and being a parliamentarian? And is it really healthy that, ele I think it was 11 members of our cabinet had been principally, their principal occupation had been special advisors before they came into the cabinet without experience of um, the world outside. I actually think that that's a great weakness and something, uh, something that we should address. I'll go, I'll be very quick. Um, being in touch, I do think that, um, and I don't mean to just resort to focus group stereotypes, that women are better at staying in touch than male politicians are. Uh, male politicians uh, suffer the pain of separation from their children and families. Do not underestimate the impact of that on the nature of our democracy. And I, I can tell you more stories about that. But women um, you know, will choose, by and large, to organize parliamentary life so they still take their children to school and to the doctor and uh, do the ordinary things of, um, of, of every, everyday life. Um, but you know, don't let's ever pretend that it's easy to combine normal life with modern politics. If you're lucky like I am and have a London seat, it is a thousand times easier than if you're uh, representing a seat in the north of the country. The things that I've found have helped me most in my own constituency have been holding open meetings which are not about anything except anything that people want to raise. And you wonder whether anybody will bother to come. But actually, I get anything between 80 and 150 people at these meetings, and they will raise everything from you know, the deeply personal to um, the big and contemporary pol politics of the day. And also, um, for the, in the 18 months run up to the election, I did 360 degree feedback right across my constituency about what they thought um, I did well and I could do better for them. Um, I think the problem with, um, with government by focus group is that it does precisely what we're trying to avoid, which is it, it leads uh, members of parliament and ministers to substitute the conclusion of the focus group for their own instinct and their own judgment. And the problem is that uh, that loss of confidence in your own judgment, your own instinctive response to a policy or to a situation is a terrible capacity to lose. And it was kind of writ large for me when somebody came back um, from having done a group in Slough before the pre-budget report and said, as if it was the Holy Grail, they'll accept flat Dell in Slough. Well, what does that mean? Um, so, um, 
Okay, listen. I think that is. Um, I, I think. That, I think those are my. Those are my, my, my reactions. You want politicians who are more risky, not with policies, but risky with themselves, prepared to um, sort of expose themselves more to the the public and the people that they represent, are willing to live outside their comfort zone, and we need to be vigilant about the politics of bollocks because there's too much of it about, and it just shuts off um, good, risky initiatives. And, uh, you know, if I ever hear um, anybody saying we must listen to the voters more um, after some ghastly, you know, by-election defeat or something, um, it's the stock response every time, and it means very little, um, because in a way it's calling on a vocabulary which is disconnected from a skill. Thank you.